So good afternoon, Satish. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to friends from all over the world. Today we have 514 friends from 16 countries registered to this event. It is amazing. Welcome, happy birthday, happy birthday to the earth. Happy Earth Day. So I'm ID1 of Kiduri Farm and Botanic Garden, and I'm very grateful to be the facilitator today. Um, especially it is with our very dear teacher, Satish Kumar, as our speaker. So today's talk is part of a series with international ecological speakers, which is organized by the Kiduri Earth Program, KEP. And KEP is an initiative co-create with Kiduri Farm and Botanic Garden and its network of collaborators and volunteers, which aims to provide life-transforming learning experience that connect people with themselves, each other, and the rest of the nature. So this year, in year 2023, KEP's Ecological Speakers Talk Series is We Are Nature. This is our topic. It is an invitation for all of us to cultivate an ecological worldview together. We are so grateful to have said this to kickstart this series of talk on the special day today, which is Earth Day. And our dear teacher, Satish, is such a big inspiration to many of us, our work in many different ways. So it is a huge challenge for me to introduce him with just a few sentences, but I will try my best. Satish is an activist for peace. He's the co-founder of the well-known Schumacher College the editor of Researcher Magazine. He's also a teacher who leads workshop internationally on holistic economics, holistic education, voluntary simplicity, as well as the author of many inspiring books. I think most of you have read some of Satish's books. For example, the very popular book, Elegant Simplicity, is now available in nine different languages. So Satish is also a regular teacher of Kiduri Farm and Botanic Garden, and he is such a big inspiration to our holistic education program development. So before we start the talk, I would like to draw your attention to a few logistic information. To bring us closer today in this online classroom, I will encourage you to keep your camera on if possible, at least during the start and at the end of the talk. And after Satish sharing, there will be chance for questions. I will invite you to make note of questions throughout the talk and make best use of the Q&A time. You can send questions to the chat box when the Q&A session is open. For viewing, you may like to choose the speaker option at the view button on the up right corner of the Zoom window to see the speaker. You may also switch back to gallery view during the Q&A uh, session so that you can see everyone. And please be reminded that this webinar will be recorded and we will share it with wider audience later to help spread the inspiration. If you come across any technical problem during the talk, you can send direct chat message to one of the participants titled as KFBG host we will help you to solve the problem. And this talk, we have simultaneous translation to Chinese available throughout the session. So in the control bar of the bottom of the uh, Zoom window, you will find a button, language. As default, we are now all in the English channel. If you wish to choose the channel to change the channel to Chinese translation, you can press the language button. We have choice among Putonghua and Cantonese. And if you just want to listen to the interpreter's voice, you can mute the original audio by clicking the same button language. So after all this logistic information, I believe everyone have your setting ready for the talk. The title of today's talk is Soil is the Source of Life. So please join me to welcome Satish for the sharing. Are you ready, Satish? Yes, I am ready. So over to you, Satish. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, ID, for your wonderful opening remarks and, uh, and wonderful introduction. And you're welcome. It is my great pleasure to 
uh, be part of this um, uh, great series that you are organizing, that we are nature. And particularly inviting me to open the session and this series on this wonderful, special, um, a sacred day, what we call the Earth Day, as the International Earth Day. 53 years ago, in 1970, Earth Day was established by uh, Gaylord Nelson, an American uh, environmental activist. And in last 53 years, this Earth Day has become a, a pivotal day, an important day in the calendar for not only environmentalists, for whole of humanity. And more than 1 billion people today are participating in the celebration of Earth and our connection with the Earth. The environmental movement, in a way, um, has a great kind of gratitude for people like Rachel Carson, who wrote her pivotal book, a seminal book called Silent Spring in 1962. And after that, and inspired by that book, um, Earth Day was established in 1970. And, and since then, many, many wonderful things have happened and the environmental and ecological awareness has spread far and wide around the world. In 1972, the United Nations organized the first UN conference on the environment in Stockholm. And I had a great privilege and pleasure to be part of that conference in 1972. I went to Stockholm to participate in that conference. And at that time, um, um, a club of Rome was established and, uh, and Limits to Growth was published um, at that time. So uh, these were the pioneers. And after that, um, also in 1973, Blueprint for Survival came out. That was another pivotal book. And, and in the same year, um, in 1973, um, 1973, 50 years ago, Small is Beautiful was published by E.F. Schumacher. That was another great um, uh, influential book, uh, particularly for... How long has it been unmute, uh, muted? I think about a minute. Okay, so yeah. I just want to say, perhaps yeah. I repeat it, that about in 1973, uh, we had um, Blueprint for Survival, and also E.F. Schumacher wrote his famous book, Small is Beautiful. And I became editor of Resurgence magazine, and also Teddy Goldsmith launched the Ecologist magazine. And so ever since the environmental movement has grown and grown and grown. Why we need environmental and ecological movement? Because first of all, and this series of uh, 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 seminars organized by Kaduri Earth Program, uh, that we are nature. That is a very important title. Most of the world, especially until 1970, before the Earth Day, believed that humans are not nature. Humans are separate from nature. When we think of nature, when we think of the environment, we think of mountains, forests, animals, birds, rivers, oceans, but not humans. So first time, in 1970, a big declaration was made that we are nature. There is no separation between humans and nature. We have come out of the, our ancestors, which is nature. 
at the time of the Big Bang, 14 billion years ago, there were no humans, there were no animals, there were no forests, just hot gas. And Big Bang, and the Big Bang was uh, at the beginning of, according to scientific imagination and a scientific story, uh, Big Bang was just matter and energy as one. And out of that matter and energy, and energy can be interpreted as consciousness. Energy can also be interpreted as spirit. So matter and spirit, matter and consciousness, matter and energy, whatever word you use. Scientists use energy, spiritual people use spirit or consciousness, but the meaning is, I think, similar. And so out of that, over 40, 14 billion years of evolution, so um, uh, the, the fungi, the insects, uh, uh, eventually the forest, uh, eventually the animals, and eventually humans arrived. So nature is our ancestor. We are born of nature. So, so see, thinking that humans and nature are separate is mistaken view. We are nature. The moment you separate yourself and say humans are not nature, then we start to think that not only humans are not nature, humans are above nature. Humans are superior to nature. And nature is only for human use. Nature is only as a resource for the economy. Nature becomes a means to an end. And we call it natural resources for human use. So first you separate nature and humans, and then you put nature's inferior, lower, and humans above and superior. And this is what we need to change. When we say we are nature, we say trees, mountains, animals, birds, oceans, rivers have as much right to exist as humans have right to exist. We all talk about human rights, but we also need to talk about rights of nature. And when we give that right to nature, the rivers have right to be clean and flow unbounded and without any hindrance, without any sewage, without any pollution, without any waste. Oceans have right to be clean and exist in their pure form without any plastic which we are putting in the ocean. And forests have right to exist as uh, lungs of the earth, um, like rainforests. And we have no right to cut and, and destroy um, rainforests. So pollution is a sin against nature. Waste is a sin against nature. So when we recognize the rights of nature, as we recognize the human rights, then we are coming close to we are nature and there's no separation from nature and humans. Now in nature, and today I'm going to talk a little bit more about one particular aspect, which is, which is the soil, which is the land. Now, as we saw the humans and nature are separate from the old traditional scientific worldview, we also think that land, is a commodity. Soil is a commodity. As nature resource for the economy, soil is only there to be used for human need. And so we have denigrated soil, but we have to understand that humans are made of soil. The word in Latin for soil is humus. The word human and humus are related. So human beings are literally soil beings. We are made of soil. Our body is made of soil. The food we eat, oranges, bananas, mangoes, wheat, rice, vegetables, herbs, flowers, they're all soil transformed. The beautiful houses we build with bricks, 
and stone and wood, they are soil transformed. So soil is the source of life. Actually, soil is life itself. The moment we think the soil is just a dirt and soil has no life, soil is just a commodity. And we start to put chemicals, fertilizers, pesticide, herbicide, all these kind of poisonous chemicals, could we think soil has no fertility in itself? Soil is not alive. That's a mistaken view. Uh, in this sacred day of Earth Day today, we need to show our loyalty to soil and we need to show our gratitude to soil. Soil is our teacher. There's a beautiful story. Um, there was a dialogue between the Buddha and his son Rahul. One day, Rahul asked his father, Father, you are a world teacher. Please tell me who is your teacher? And Buddha was sitting with both hands like this on his lap. He lifted the right hand and touched the soil and said, soil is my teacher. Can you imagine? The Buddha says, the soil is my teacher. So Rahul asked the Buddha, what do you learn from soil? And the Buddha says, the first and foremost, I learn from the soil, the, the lesson of forgiveness. Look at what we do to soil. We build on it. We tread on it. We dig it. We plant seeds in it. We do all sorts of things. And yet soil forgives. So I learn the lesson of forgiveness from soil. Then Rahul asked, what else do you learn, Father, from the soil? And Buddha says that I learn from the soil unconditional love without any judgment, without any condition. You plant a seed and the seed becomes food and a tree and then it becomes fruit like an apple tree or a mango tree or an orange tree. And whoever you are, you are a king or a beggar. You are a saint or a sinner. You are a priest or a prisoner. You are a human or an animal, a bird, a wasp, a bee. Whoever you are, without any judgment, without any discrimination, without anything in return, the tree gives, soil gives, fruit, vegetables, herbs, grain, everything to all living beings without any judgment. If you want to learn this unconditional compassion, unconditional love, I learned that from the soil. That was a dialogue between the Buddha and his son Rahul. And so we, as the Buddha does, we need to learn to pay our gratitude to the soil. And we need to say every day, I mean, I'm a gardener and I have been blessed to have two acres of garden. And for the last 40 years, I have been building soil in my garden. Every scrap of kitchen waste, every leaf falling from the trees, I collect them. And any, any grass, I collect them and put them on the compost. And, and that compost goes back on the, on the, uh, on the uh, bed. Uh, vegetable bed, soil. So building soil is our greatest responsibility. The, the world, nature, our earth is dependent and based on the principle of mutuality and reciprocity. As soil feeds us, we need to feed the soil. And there, therefore it is our sacred responsibility to build the soil and keep the soil in good heart. Once I was meeting a wonderful lady called Lady Eve Balfour and she wrote a wonderful book called The Living Soil and she was the founder of the Soil Association in Great Britain 
I was visiting her. It was a month of late April. And her garden was very good, in a very good heart and a very good condition. And so I asked Lady Eve Balfour, your garden is looking so good. What do you do to the garden to look so good, so green and so um, fresh and so um, uh, attractive? Lady Eve said to me, Satish, I don't do anything. I just take care of the soil. And soil takes care of everything else. That answer has remained with me and in my memory forever. That was maybe uh, 40 years ago that she said to me this thing. And her book, The Living Soil. If you are really interested in soil and in nature, and we are nature, I highly recommend you to read Lady Eve Balfour's book, The, the Living Soil. And so, um, soil is my teacher, and building soil is my responsibility. Because if I build the soil, if I give food to the soil, and the living soil, then soil will feed me. And so, every day when I want to cook my lunch, I don't have to think about anything, what I'm going to cook. I don't have to go to supermarket. I don't have to go to shop. I just go to my garden. And what is there? My garden is my freezer. My garden is my refrigerator. My garden is my shop. My garden is my supermarket. I just go to the garden. What is there at this moment? This is a kind of late April. And then whole of May, I will have asparagus for my garden. And they are so wonderful. Yesterday evening, I went to the garden and I collected some, uh, some um, asparagus and had a wonderful dinner. So, and then every, every month, there's a new vegetable. And so for me, this is the greatest luxury to have my own garden with a very fertile and very solid. So I've been building soil, 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 higher and higher. And now my garden is as, as soil has as deep as a three feet, two and a half, three feet deep soil I have. And so I don't need to dig it. Another great teacher, like Lady Eve Balfour, I mentioned, another great teacher I met. I was, it's a great privilege and, and a kind of great um, um, uh, pleasure to have met a very great man of soil called Masanobu Fukuoka. He was a Japanese scientist, soil scientist. And he said that you don't need to dig. You don't need to plow. You just trust the soil and plant a seed in the soil. And the soil will do everything for you. You don't need to do anything. Just be a lazy person. Just plant this, the seed in the soil. One seed of an apple you put in the soil. That one little seed can become a tree. And that from that one seed, you get thousand apples. Year after year after year. And depending on the kind of tree you have, that one apple tree, one mango tree, one pear tree, whatever the tree you have, that one tree will last you for 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. Apples after apples after year, apples, year after year after year. That is generosity of nature, generosity of soil, generosity of the tree without any judgment, without any discrimination, that tree produces apples. That's the quality of the soil. Soil creates the tree. The trunk you see is a soil transformed. The branches, the leaves, the blossom, the fruit is all coming from the soil. And so, and each apple had four or five or six more seeds in, in them. It's a magic, it's a miracle of nature that one seed is producing thousands of apples and each apple has in turn five, six uh, seeds. And from that one seed you planted, you can create a whole orchard. That's a miracle, that's a magic. That's a kind of glorious 
example, gracious example of the generosity of soil. I have 15 apple trees in my garden and I am blessed and I planted them. And now every year, last year, we had apple season and, and amazing. We have so many apples that uh, our family could not consume them. So we used to put a boxes of apples in front of our house with a, with a notice, please help yourself, anybody passing by. We have so many apples, we cannot use them. We made 200 bottles of apple juice that will last us forever. We had uh, five bags of potatoes and that will last for us whole year. We had uh, three bags of onions and garlic and carrots, you name it. And then of course, strawberries and raspberries and, uh, and all the other um, the fruit that you get. So I am grateful to the soil. That gratitude, we have to understand and express our gratitude. We take soil for granted. We, we think that um, humans are so clever, they can produce Apple, uh, Apple um, the computer. Now your Apple computer and an Apple tree, just compare the two. Can your Apple computer produce more uh, uh, Apple computers? No, you need always to dig more plastic, metal, um, all the kind of minerals, chemicals to make the, the computer. A computer cannot produce another computer, but a seed can produce another many, many more seeds. And so the magic, the miracle, and the mystery of nature and mystery of soil is something unsurpassable. And so, but we humans think the soil is just for granted. Soil is dead. Uh, so, soil is only a commodity. Soil is only a resource for the economy. Soil is only a, a kind of, uh, kind of um, um, dead. I want to remind all of us that earth is not dead. Earth is not a dead rock. It's a living organism. Soil is not a commodity. Soil is a community. Please remember this. Soil is not a commodity. Soil is a community. Soil is our identity. Land is our identity. When we think that I'm an Indian or I'm a, a, a French or I'm a Chinese or I'm from Hong Kong or Taiwan or Japan or, or any other country. But we have come from the earth before, I mean, India, China, Japan, Hong Kong, all these countries are part of the earth. The earth day today, we have to remember we are part of the earth. The entire earth is our home. Whole cosmos is our country. Nature is our nationality and love is our religion. That is a kind of magnanimous mind that we have to cultivate so that we embrace the, the mystery and the magic and the, the magnanimity of the universe in our magnanimous mind. And then, this is why I feel that uh, we in our modern world need, need to be humble. Now, I use the word humble and humility because as I said, the word human comes from humus and humus means soil. Humility also comes from soil. The humus, human, humility are all related words. So we humans need to be humble, practice humility. Without humility, there's no humanity. So in humility, we say, soil, you are our mother. Soil, you are the source of life. You are life itself. And, and, and not just a kind of um, means to an end. At the moment, we see nature as a means to an end. The end is economic growth. End is more production, more consumption. End is um, uh, profit, making more money. So farmers farm, <coughs> produce food to make money. We have to change that. If we really want to celebrate Earth Day, and if we really want to celebrate we are nature, we all, if we really want to celebrate soil as a source of life, then we have to see that soil and land and earth and nature are not means to an end. Nature, the integrity of nature is the end. And economy, profit, production, consumption should be the means 
to maintain the integrity of nature. Unfortunately, not only we see nature as a, a means to an end, we even have started to think the humans are a means to an end. I mean, each business, industry, big corporations, even government departments, they have a department called HR. HR, in conventional way, stands for human resources. So not only we talk about natural resources, we also talk about human resources. So humans have become a means to an end, a resource. You are hired and fired. If you are not making profit for the company, you are not being useful to, um, to, uh, <coughs> for economic growth, then you are fired. So humans also have become a resource, a means to an end. On Earth Day, today, we need to make a new pledge, a new loyalty. We have to say that we pay allegiance to soil and to humans, because humans are soil. As I said, human beings are soil beings. Humans and human come from the same root. And so we say that humans and soil are not means to an end. The integrity of nature, integrity of soil, and dignity of humans come first. And all our economic growth, all our profit, all our money, all our production and consumption and shopping, all those things are means to maintain the integrity of nature and, and, and highlight and, and honor the dignity of humans. So HR, human resources, I would like to change the, the, the word from HR, human resources, to HR should stand for human relationship. We are here in relationship. We are all related. We are all interconnected. We are all interbeings. I see whole world in myself. And I see myself in the whole world. We are all made of the same basic elements. We are all made of earth, air, fire, water. And we are made of consciousness. And as we humans are made of earth, air, fire, water, and consciousness, all living beings, forests, mountains, animals, birds, rivers, are also made of earth, air, fire, water, and consciousness. Earth is not a dead rock. Earth is a living organism. Earth has consciousness. Earth has intelligence. Earth has memory. Trees have memory. Animals have memory. My friend and a great scientist, Rupert Sheldrake, calls it morphic resonance. And so if we have this new scientific worldview, this is a new science going away and moving on um, from Newtonian science of mechanistic thinking that nature is a machine and Earth is a dead rock. Moving from that, we have a James Lovelock, who was one of our first teacher at Schumacher College, James Lovelock, who uh, wrote uh, um, uh, the book called Gaia, The Living Organism. Um, so he said the Earth is a living organism. And so many, many scientists following his work, um, like uh, Rupert Sheldrake, Prashop Kapra, Vandana Shiva, um, uh, David Bowen, and many others, uh, Brian Goodwin, and many of them have been teachers at Schumacher College. We have all upheld and promoted this new science of life. And the new science of life is the earth is a living organism, soil is a living organism, humans come from the soil. So if we have that unity of life, unity of life manifesting in many diverse forms, we can embrace the diversity and unity together. So Big Bang, energy and matter, they were unity, they were one. You cannot separate matter and energy. You cannot separate body and soul. You cannot separate um, matter and spirit. They came together as a big bang. And so out of that unity of life, unity of matter and energy, life flourished. 
over 14 billion years of evolution, evolution has favored diversity. And now we have billions and billions of forms and trillions and trillions of forms manifesting that one unity of energy and matter. And so we need to celebrate diversity <coughs> and celebrate unity. Unity and diversity dance together. But at the moment, we are turning our unity into uniformity. Uniformity is not unity. We are spreading this industrial globalized economy, Coca-Cola everywhere, McDonald's everywhere, high-rise um, buildings everywhere, blue jeans everywhere. Same kind of economic system, same kind of political system. We want something same, same, same. That is not the, the part of natural uh, evolution. Evolution favors diversity. And we are turning diversity into division and conflict. And we say, you are Chinese, you are Indian, you are Pakistani, you are Russian, you are American, you are Hindu, you are Muslim, you are Christian, you are Buddhist, you are separate, separate, separate. In the name of religion, in the name of nationality, in the name of um, race, in the name of sex, in the name of wealth, whatever the name you put, we are promoting separation and division and conflict. So um, if you want to celebrate Earth Day, and if you want to honor the integrity of soil and nature, then we have to see diversity and unity and away from uniformity and, and division. So when we say all life is interconnected, interrelated, interbeing, we are one manifesting in many forms, then we can cultivate a kind of radical love, what I call my new book is Radical Love. And in that radical love, I'm saying that we have to extend our love by loving ourselves. Of course, we start with ourselves. We love all people. We love all nature. We love whole humanity. We love whole planet Earth. That is a kind of uh, approach that I would like to see um, the people realizing. And therefore, we can move from this ego separation to eco relationship, from separation to relationship. When the separation and division end, all suffering ceases. All our sufferings are caused by division, conflict, separation, lack of relationship. The moment you become friends of the earth, that's a beautiful title on Earth Day and the beautiful organization, friends of the earth. We are friends of the earth. We are friends of each other. We are friends of China. We are friends of Russia. We are friends of America. We are friends of India. We are friends of Hindu. We are friends of Muslims. We are friends of Christians. We are friends of black. We are friends of white. We are friends of old. We are friends of young. We are friends of capitalists. We are friends of communists. We are friends of poor. We are friends of rich. We are friends of everyone. That is the real lesson of the soil. Soil does not discriminate against anyone. Soil feeds whoever you are. So it is our responsibility to feed and nurture and nourish and love everyone. The moderate love is to love someone you like. And you expect them to love you back. But the radical love, and that is a lesson I have learned from the soil. The radical love is to love even those who don't love you and don't respect you and don't agree with you. And then you transform um, uh, them through your love. That's what I call monsoon of love. There's no hurt which cannot be healed by love. There are no problems which cannot be solved by love. So if you bring that uh, ultimate love, that's a radical love into your practice, and then that is a lesson that I learned from the soil. I think I have spoken enough. My, I'm passionate about soil, as you can see. I'm passionate about nature, and I am nature. I am soil, and, and so soil is not separate from me. And this unity of life is very dear to my heart. So I hope I have communicated, communicated some of my passion, some of my conviction for nature, for soil, for humanity, for the whole cosmos. As I said, cosmos is my country. Whole planet Earth is my home. <laughs> nature is my nationality and love is my religion. I move away from ego separation to eco relationship. 
I change from G to C, from ego to eco, then I am happy. So if you want to be happy, celebrate nature, see yourself as nature, celebrate soil. If you have no soil, find a little, little box where you can put a little bit of soil and plant something, a little herbs, a mint, or, or some flowers, so that you can be in touch with the soil. Soil is our teacher, soil is our guru. So be a gardener if you can, even if you are in big cities like Beijing or Shanghai or Hong Kong or, or New Delhi or New York, wherever you are, city or countryside, I want everybody to be in touch with the soil, embrace the soil, respect the soil, have a relationship with the soil. That is my deep conviction and my deep passion, which I am trying to communicate to you. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to share some of my passion with you. Thank you. And I'll be very happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Satish, for sharing your, uh, I mean, the passion and the conviction is so moving. And also the highlight of changing the, um, what we used to say, we are nature to we are nature, which is so fundamental for the transformation for the change to make. And thank you so much for highlighting on the Earth Day very importantly that soil is life, source of life, is our teacher, is a community, it offers unconditional love, generosity, and also this beautiful story on beautiful experience with your garden, your friends, and the encouragement for us to start even with a small box of soil, and also maybe lobbying for changing our human resources department to become human relations. All these are so, I feel so rich. Ruth. Thank you, thank you, thank you. This is why I love Kaduri Farm and Botanical Garden, because you have a 350 acres of soil and the hills and the forest and the trees and the birds and the animals and the insects. So such a rich a place that you have. Kaduri Farm and Botanical Garden. And this is why I love coming there and being in nature and celebrating nature with you. So I want to congratulate you, Idi, and all your colleagues who are part of Kaduri Farm and Botanical Garden. You are a good example of uh, the living soil and how to care for the soil and how to look after the soil and how soil looks after you. That's a good example. Thank you so much, Satish. And we are looking forward for your visit in this October. And we can actually spread the message wider. Thank you. So now I would like to open the space for um, taking questions from the participants. Um, and um, if you have any questions, you can type into the chat box, either in Chinese or English. We will work with it. So um, I. Yeah, so we start with the first question from uh, Bikram, which is um, asking Satish, could you share your views on ecological service for soil? Ecological service? For soil. For soil. Okay. Um, um, ecological, eco and ecology, the word comes from Greek language. And the logos means knowledge. So ecology means knowledge of the ecosystem. The ecos words is also very beautiful. Ecos means home. And so knowledge of your home <clears throat> is ecology. And then <clears throat> economy, nomos means management. So ecos and nomos, home management. And in the wisdom of the Greek philosophers, the entire planet is your home. So knowing your home is ecology. And then managing your home properly without waste, without pollution, without damaging, that's economy. So ecological services to soil is to know the quality of the soil, the nature of the soil, the, the, the soils are not one, like humans are, uh, humans are one, whole humanity is one, but within that humanity, we have diversity. 
So we have a different shapes, different forms, different colors, different uh, color of hair, different kind of eye, eyes. Um, Chinese are different from, um, from uh, Indians. Indians are different from Africans. Africans are different from Europeans. So even though we are one humanity, we manifest in diversity. In the same way, soil is also different. Sometimes you have black soil. Sometimes you have a red soil. Sometimes you have brown soil. Sometimes you have a black soil. So all these soils are different. And so you have to learn and know your soil and the quality of the soil and the nature of the soil. So ecological services is to know and manage and maintain the quality of the soil and go along the soil, grain of the soil, so that you don't try to impose uh, your kind of um, ideas, um, uh, but you learn from the soil. So ecological services, the, 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 we have sometimes misused the word ecological services, again, like, um, uh, like um, we measure it in terms of money. And we say, how valuable are forests? A forest of maybe 100 acres or 1,000 acres uh, gives us um, uh, $10 million uh, worth of air or $10 million worth of oxygen, or takes $10 million worth of carbon. That kind of ecological services is not my favorite uh, word, because I don't think that we can measure the value of nature in terms of dollars and pounds and euros and, 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 and all the money that we have. And so, I would say ecological services should be interpreted that how um, we how we understand the knowledge of soil, knowledge of forest, knowledge of animals, knowledge of birds, and and working according to the the harmony and the rhythm of nature. That to me is more an ecological service and ecological uh, understanding. Uh, but the moment you start to measure. Uh, ecological services in terms of money, and this is how many people are using that term, ecological services, then I think we are missing something. How can you measure the value of the air you breathe? You cannot live without breathing air for five minutes or a or, or, or few sec seconds even. You cannot measure. How can you measure the value of the milk you are getting from the breast of your mother? You cannot value, you cannot put any money, a monetary value on it. So trying to measure nature and nature services and ecological services um, uh, in terms of money is I think mistaken view. Uh, maybe as a kind of matter of convenience or matter of some argument, you might use that, but ultimately nature is beyond monetary measurement, monetary value. Um, we have to say nature is invaluable, soil is invaluable, human life is invaluable, breathing air is invaluable, motherhood is invaluable. You cannot measure everything in terms of money. Money is a good thing, only as a means to an end, only a means of exchange of goods and services. The moment money becomes your master and use everything you start to measure in terms of money and money becomes even a status symbol and money becomes a way of controlling other people, then that's a misuse of money. So I would not value the nature services and services of nature in terms of, uh, in terms of um, measuring in terms of money. I will say they are invaluable and without nature, we cannot live whatever the value of money, monetary value you put on it. Okay. Next question. Thank you, Satish. Um, the response you make highlight um, how mindset may affect us in seeing the relationship between us and also well, as term of we are nature. And also I have a question which is related to the previous question, which is sort of how we shape our mindset and how we transform our mindset in seeing the values of um, nature. So this is a question from Iris. She's asking about when we are shifting or transforming our mindset, how can we be persistent? How can we strengthen our mind on this journey of loving the earth? Can you share some yes. 
How do we strengthen our mind? How do we learn all these things? It's a, it's a question of learning. Everything can be learned. Like how do you learn to play piano? How do you learn to play uh, cricket? How do you learn to um, speak Chinese language? If I am coming from India, I want to learn Chinese um, or, or uh, Japanese. How do I learn? It's a daily practice. So, um, so to learn, to strengthen our minds, like how do you strengthen your body? Mm -hmm. How do you, every day you do yoga. Mm -hmm. Every day you do some exercise. Every day you tai chi. Every day you do some qigong. You practice something which will strengthen your body. In the same way, you strengthen your mind by mental kind of process of exercise. So, for example, all the great traditions, Buddhist, Taoist, Jain, Hindu, Christian, all the great religious traditions, they have taught us to strengthen the mind, a practice of meditation. Now, when you sit in silence, calm mind, and allow to let go of all your anxiety, all your worries, all your anger, all your fear, all your doubts, you let go from your mind. You learn to strengthen your mind. And meditation is a good practice. And you have to do it every day. People sometimes say, oh, I can't meditate. My mind doesn't stay still. If you start to learn piano, and the first week you say, oh, I can't play piano. The keyboards, I don't remember. It takes months. It takes years to become a good pianist. In the same way, if you want to learn to meditate, to strengthen your mind, you have to practice it every day. Human potential is enormous. Everything is potentially within us, given to us by the universe. You have capacity to, be, to, to love. You have capacity to be courageous. You have capacity to be generous and kind. But you have to learn it. Like you can learn to play piano, or you can learn to do tai chi or qigong. You can learn to meditate. You can learn to be compassionate. You can learn to be kind. You can learn to be generous. You can learn to be loving. So every day you, you need to, or I need to, whoever wants to learn, every day we have to practice it. Practice, practice, practice. This is the only way you can learn. There's no other way. Um, nobody's going to come and give you, uh, here is a here is, um, way to strengthen your mind. There's no pill. There's no injection. There's no medicine. The medicine of the mind is meditation. The word medicine and the meditation come from the same root. So medicine is for the body. To, to heal your body, you take some medicine. You, uh, you take some herbs or some, uh, if you have hurt your body, you put some anika on it. In the same way, to heal your mind, to strengthen your mind, you need to practice meditation. That is the, the old, old, age old wisdom that we have learned from many, many uh, spiritual traditions and spiritual wisdom uh, all over the world. And so I will recommend um, a, a daily practice of meditation, daily practice of compassion, daily practice of love, and daily practice of courage. Thank you so much, Satish. Practice make perfect. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so now we have another question from Janet. Um, she's asking, how would you persuade and influence people who do not believe in we are nature? Okay. Um, we cannot convince people by preaching. Preaching is that I am right, you are wrong. Preaching is that I know the truth, you don't. So you must listen to me and follow me. That's a preaching. That is not the right way. For me, is communication. Communication is a both way. You communicate, you learn, and you teach together. So rather than preaching, 
we need to learn the skillful ways of communicating our ideas. And in order to communicate, it's not just an intellectual academic theory that we have to communicate. It has to be a living experience, living example. So before we can communicate, we have to be the change that we want to see in the world. So we have to practice that we are nature and our own activities, our own being should reflect that conviction. Like a radiator radiates heat. You radiate your conviction from your whole being. And so be the change that you want to see in the world. This is the phrase used by Mahatma Gandhi. Be the radiator. When you will are radiator, you will radiate your uh, conviction and your passion and your values. So first be the radiator and then learn the skills of communication. And you can communicate through many, many ways. You can write books, you can speak, you can write songs, like our Beatle uh, poet John Lennon wrote a beautiful song, Imagine. That's a, how he communicated the vision and the values of his, uh, um, his um, ideals, by writing songs. Picasso communicated through paintings. He painted a great picture painting called Guernica, which was showing the horrors of war. That painting was a message of peace. And so you can communicate through music, dance, poetry, or your Kaduri farm is a wonderful way of communicating. And many, many young children and young people come to your farm and they see how you are producing organic uh, food and vegetables and fruit, how you are maintaining the forest, how you are looking after the animals, how you are looking after the biodiversity and, and, and all kinds of life forms there. That's a good example of communication. So be the change and communicate the change in a skillful way in a convincing way, but without preaching, without telling you other people, I'm holier than thou, I know better than you, um, uh, and you have to follow me. Uh, that is not the way. Preaching is not the way. Communicating is a two-way dialogue. And the third thing you can do is to join others. Work together. No one person can create a movement. Any movement, the movement of Martin Luther King, to bring an end to racism, but joined by hundreds of thousands of people to bring an end to apartheid in South Africa. All around the world, people were joining the movement against apartheid. So India's independence movement came together by um, uh, hundreds of thousands of people working together. So join together. All our flourishing is mutual. All our thriving is mutual working together and working together in a non-violent way, a loving way. Violence is no way to transform the world. In a violent way, you can kill your opponent. You can kill your enemy. You kill one enemy, another enemy will come. And another enemy will come. Another enemy will come. How many can you kill? So we must follow the non-violent way of resistance non-violent way of protest, non-violent way of transformation. And, and not only protest, we also need to protect what is already good in the world. There is a beauty we have to protect. There are small farms we have to protect. There are craftsmanship which we have to protect. There are traditional skills we have to protect. Indigenous communities, uh, um, uh, so, um, so Aboriginal people in, in um, uh, Australia, uh, the, the indigenous people in North America uh, and the Adivasis in India, all these cultures have to be protect. So protecting is as important as protesting. And then also we have to build the constructive program and the new initiatives like your Kaduri farm is a building new culture. Schumacher College, they're building new culture. Um, and many, many other good projects are emerging. Um, the organic farm, uh, the holistic schools, uh, many, many other good things you can do. So protest, protect, and build. But do it all with love, with nonviolence. No violence. <coughs> if there's any suffering to be caused, I, as a protester, should take suffering upon myself 
rather than inject or inflict or impose suffering on my opponent, on the other people. So without causing suffering on other people, like Mahatma Gandhi, like Martin Luther King, like Nelson Mandela, like Mother Teresa, like Vangari Mathai, the many, many glorious, wonderful example of great leaders who have shown the way of non-violent resistance and, and communicating non-violently. So be the change, communicate the change, join other people to change and do it all with love and with non-violence. That is the way to transform your opponent and convince other people what is right and what is wrong. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> Thank you, Satish. So um, now we have another question. Um, from Juliana, who would like to know more about you. Um, she was wondering, when in your life has this understanding of we are nature taken root in your soul? Was it? Okay, that's a very good question. You know, when I was 26 years old, I went around the world for peace. And I went without any money because I said to myself that wars begin in fear. Peace begins in trust. So I have, if I want to protest against war, then I have to protest against fear. And if I want to work for peace and build peace, then I have to build trust. How do I show that I trust? If I go with money, I don't have to trust anybody. I trust money. And I go and stay in a hotel, eat in a restaurant, buy my shoes and clothes. I don't need anybody. But when I have no money, I have to depend on other people to support me. So I went without any money for two and a half years and depended on nature and on people. And that is when walking day by day, through the mountains, through the desert, through the forest, under the rain, under the sun, under the snow, all kinds of natural um, seasons and weathers and topography, mountains, deserts, everything. I realized that I am made of nature. I am made of the sun. If there's no sun, I will not be here. I am made of water. If there's no water, I will not be here. I am made of the earth. If there's no, uh, I, uh, there's no earth, I am not here. I'm made of the air. If there's no air, I'm not here. And I'm not here without the, the Afghanis and the Iranians and the Russians. If they did not feed me, I will not be here. I'm, I'm here because of my ancestors. If the ancestors were not here, my parents, grandparents, great, great grandparents, and before that, um, uh, chimpanzees and, and the monkeys and, and the dinosaurs, and before that, uh, matter and energy. So my utter interdependence came to me while I'm walking around the world, day after day, week after week, month after month, for two and a half years, I was on the earth. I was a child of the earth. And I experienced the sun, the rain, the snow, the desert, the mountains, the animals, the forest, and the humanity. So total interdependence was self-realized. So this was a moment of self-realization. And when you have a self-realization, you do realize that we are all nature. There's no separation. There's no division. There's no conflict. Conflict is you know, a kind of creation of our mind. In our mind, we analyze and say, this is good, that is bad. But there was a great poet, a Sufi poet called Jalaluddin Rumi. And Rumi said that there is a field beyond right and wrong. I shall meet you there. That is a kind of a, a lesson that I learned during my walk. I met people who were followers of Rumi. I met people who were followers of Hafiz in Iran. I met people who were followers of Tolstoy in Russia. I went to visit Tolstoy's farm and house. So that journey of two and a half years of walking without money through 15 different countries, communist countries, capitalist countries, rich countries, poor countries, mountains, deserts, snow, forest, everything. 
that was the a, a kind of experience of self realization and i realized that i am nature and i am interconnected and i am into being that's how i realized it thank you wow so now we have two questions related to climate change um one is related to well uh, first of all josephine i could thank you for the inspiring talk and so she is asking, are you optimistic about the human induced global warming? And is it possible to reverse the trend? And a similar a related question from David is um, whether you would agree caring for and regenerating global soil would be the single most important solution for climate change? Yes, yes. Um, first of all, the question is, am I an optimist? So the answer is yes, absolute unconditional yes. I am an optimist because if you are a pessimist, you give up. You cannot be an activist. A pessimist cannot be an, a good activist. So to be an activist, you have to be an optimist. And we can do something. There's always, whenever you wake up, there's a morning. Always something you can do. So I am an activist. And as I said, I walk around the world as a peace activist. I'm an eco activist, environmental activist, a spiritual activist. So my activism and optimism go together. My hope goes together. But hope is not a passive hope. It's an active hope. Activism. Um, uh, and optimism comes with an active hope, not a passive hope. Because when you have active hope, then say, yes, there is a <clears throat> light at the end of the tunnel, but I'll walk to it. I'll do something about it. I'm not going to just sit and wait and say something will turn up. Something will happen. Some good will emerge. I don't have to do anything. No, I'm an activist and I have an active hope. And I believe that this system, which is causing global warming, climate change, and so much carbon emission, this all is happening. So all man-made, human-made. What is made by humans can be changed by humans. It's not something God-given. It's not something universe-given. It's, it's a created by humans. The, the carbon emission, all the kind of industry with producing uh, pollution and waste and carbon, is created by humans. So we are, can be innovative, we can be intelligent, we can be compassionate to the earth, and we can create a new system, which is without pollution, without waste, without carbon emission. We can live an elegant, simple, comfortable, good life. It's possible. Nature is abundant. Nature is generous. We can be abundant and generous. Nature is regenerative. As I said, one seed can produce a whole tree and a whole tree can produce thousands of apples and more seeds in it. It's a regenerative. This is the economy of nature. So if we learn from the economy of nature and the human economy becomes in the economy of nature or we mimic like biomimicry of Janine Benius, then I think we can change. So be an optimist, be an activist, have a hope and do your best. But at the same time, I act without expecting the results. Because results are not in my hands. The outcome is not under my control. Only thing in my hand and under my control is to act. I can do my best. I will serve day after day. I will serve the humanity. I'll serve the planet Earth. That is my conviction. Whatever the result, whatever I achieve or not achieve, Whatever I'm doing is worth doing. And therefore, I offer my service. I offer my life. And to the last breath of my life, I will be an activist. And I'll be an optimist. And I'll serve the planet. I'll serve humanity. That is my goal. And whatever result is not in my hand. My action has its own intrinsic value. Act and act and act. Without any desire, without any expectation, without any attachment, for outcome or result or achievement. If that the purity of heart, that purity of imagination, that purity of consciousness leads to purity of action 
and then action will bring results um, as a gift to me. And that will, I will be grateful if there's an achievement. And, and so, for example, Schumacher College, uh, we started, and now many people are coming there. That's a gift. People come, that's a gift. And many, many people have supported and, and are blessed, and we are grateful to it. But I started all this Schumacher College without any kind of expectation of what I will achieve. I started as an act of service to humanity, as an act of service to our planet Earth. That is all we can do. So the answer is yes, I am an optimist. And I will be an optimist, I promise you, up to the last breath of my life. I'm here to serve. And the soil, yes, answer is yes. Soil sequestrates carbon more effectively, more efficiently than any other form of sequestration. So if we build the soil, if we build the forest, if we build the trunks and the trees, they will sequestrate carbon. I know your Kaduri farm is a wonderful example. I know another farm in Italy <clears throat> called Fattoria La Viala. Now they have 2000 hectares maybe. It's a beautiful farm. It's organic, it's a biodynamic, and they produce um, olive oil, they produce good wine, they produce cheese, they produce pasta, bread, um, many, many good things, and mostly by hand. They employ 150 people there and they don't sell anything directly or, 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 or to, to shops, supermarkets or restaurants. They don't sell anything to um, supermarkets or shops or restaurants. Everything is bought by the customers directly from the shop or supplied online. And the, many scientists are studying that farm. Uh, there's a, a University of Siena in Italy, and they are studying that farm and how the carbon is sequestrated and how the climate change and the global warming is addressed by this farming method. And this, the scientists of Siena University have concluded that every farm was farmed in this way and the soil was protected and soil was um, looked after to sequestrate this carbon, then there may be a problem of climate cooling and, and a, a global cooling rather than global heating. And that's a scientific study uh, from University of Siena after studying the, this uh, Fattoria La Viala farm. And so I am totally convinced that yes, if we farm properly and if we look after soil and build soil organically, we can address the problem of climate change. But we also need to reduce our energy um, uh, consumption and fossil fuel emission because carbon emission uh, should be minimal. Nature can absorb certain amount of carbon emission, but not so much. Day after day, week after week, we are wasting so much energy. So we must be frugal and, and, and live simply, elegant simplicity, as you mentioned my book, read that book and I'm describing all these things in the book and, and it's in Chinese and it's in um, Hong Kong as well. And so you can get that book. So yes, soil can sequestrate carbon and is the real answer to climate change. Thank you, Satish. Thank you for drawing this global perspective on soil. And the next question is related to a more like at local perspective. This is a question from Naning, and she is asking, well, um, if your lifestyle currently does not allow you to keep a garden, how might you still regularly nurture the soil? Okay. You know, even on your roof, you can create a little garden. Even on the window, you can create a little garden. If you don't have that possibility, then find a friend who might have a garden who, where you can volunteer to help, to touch the soil and be in touch with the plants and be in touch with the herbs and, 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 and with the earthworms. They are great inspiration. If you can't find a friend who has a, a garden, then go for the weekend to a farm. Maybe if you are in Hong Kong, go to Kaduri farm and say, can I volunteer for a few hours and, and, and uh, compost or water your plants or do something for you as a volunteer. 
If you have a will, there is a way. Wherever you are, you can be in Hong Kong, you can be in Shanghai, you can be in Beijing, you can be in Kolkata, you can be in New York. If you have a will, there is a way. I was in London um, uh, not long ago, and I was visiting a friend, and he served me tea with fresh green mint. And normally I get a, a tea bag of mint tea. So I asked my friend, you have fresh mint in, in the center of London, near Oxford Street. He said, yes, I grow this mint. I said, where do you grow? He said, come with me, I'll show you where I grow. And we went upstairs. And on the roof, he had sage, mint, thyme, flowers, and he had a beehives on the roof. And he gave me a pot of honey. And he said, I made this honey on the roof uh, of, the, of the sixth um, floor, above the sixth floor, in, near Oxford Street, in the center of London. You, if you will, if you want to do it, you can find a way. So find a farmer where you can go and volunteer. Find a gardener who might be your friend or neighbor, or just make a friendship with somebody who has a garden. Or no, and the minimum is they can have a, a box and, and, um, and put some soil, and you can make the soil. Your kitchen waste, your orange peels, your banana peels, your potato peels, everything can be put in a, a little bucket. And within six weeks, it will transform itself into soil. So soil is the easiest way to make if you have willingness to make it. To make the soil, put the soil in a box, put some seeds in it, and everything will happen by itself. So do not be uh, pessimistic. Where there's a will, there's a way. You can do it, wherever you are. Yeah, when there is a will, there is a way. Absolutely. Yes. So, so this day is another question, um, which is likely different perspective from Man Yong Tong asking about education. So what do you think are the biggest problem with the current environmental education? <clears throat> the problem is not environmental education. The problem is education itself. Because um, in our education, first of all, when you go to a school or a university, the teachers look at you and they think that you have no body. The students have no body. Students have no heart. Students have no hands. Students have no legs. They have only brain and only half brain. Because we have two hemispheres of the brain. The left hemisphere is the hemisphere of reasoning, logical, administrative, managerial, and practical. The right hemisphere of the brain is more intuitive, more imaginative, more spiritual, more relational, more creative. All our educational system is just spending billions and billions and billions of dollars and euros and pounds and whatever money you have just to train half brain. That's tragic. That's tragic. We need to educate the whole person. Education of head, education of heart, education of hands. As I mentioned to you before in the previous question, that we can learn at school and university how to be kind, how to be compassionate, how to be a gardener, how to be a builder, how to be a potter. Our education system needs to teach the practical skills to use our hands and also cultivate heart qualities of compassion and kindness and generosity and respect for each other and sharing with each other and serving each other and also right hemisphere of the brain of creativity, of poetry, of imagination, of spirituality, of meditation. All these things have to be also cultivated. So it's not environmental education, which is problem. It's a lack of environmental education. We don't learn anything from nature. As I said, uh, uh, talking about the soil, soil is our teacher. <coughs> nature is our teacher. Trees are our teacher. The Buddha sat under the tree and got enlightenment. He learned from the tree. Nowadays, we don't get enlightenment because we don't sit under a tree. Of course, you, um, ID, you have Kaduri farm where you sit under the tree. But the people who live in big cities, they don't go out. They just look at their, um, their iPhone 
or their smartphone or their computers or they are in their car or they are in front of their television they are in the box they are living in a box and thinking in a box so if you really want good education then you have to learn how to think out of box and how to live out of box so at the moment our education system is very boxed it's in a kind of very narrow and this is why we established shubhakar college to bring education of head education of heart and education of hands whole person education a holistic education and an education where we go out in nature and learn from nature nature is our teacher which i have already said so if we have that kind of education then we can have a good education for the whole world thank you satish so here come another question also related to the existing system this is a question from jonas he is asking do you believe it is feasible to reform the current global system considering that the notion of separation is deeply rooted within it or do you think the current system must undergo some form of collapse to pave the way for a new system that is more aligned with interdependence um the thing is that we as humans individuals we don't have a control over the whole global system but we can create new local systems so wherever you are each and every one of us let us start doing something to build a new holistic culture bottom up rather than hoping the top down some government will come and change the system uh, whether it is uh, joe biden in america or modi in india or any other prime minister or president or kremlin or the white house or the um, the uh, all the big big uh, centers of power start, change will not start from the center change never comes from the center a big radical change always starts on the fringe a great river starts in somewhere in the mountains and hills as a small trickle then many many tributaries join in together and then it becomes a great river so if you want to uh, see a new world order we have to start ourselves on the fringe and join together with other people like tributaries and make a great river of transformation and as far as the collapse is concerned i think this industrial system based on waste and pollution and based on uh, uh, exploitation of of resources cannot last forever is bound to collapse sooner or later so it is better for whole of humanity to build alternative structures this is why i said before protest protect and build so if we build alternative education alternative farming alternative crafts and arts alternative food which is holistic which is waste free which is pollution free which is more human which is more spiritual which is more imaginative which is more creative which is more poetic and artistic i think we can create a new system and then this old system will disappear will collapse it it cannot last forever it's too heavy it cannot last forever maybe 10 20 50 years already starting to crack and and we we are living in a kind of wars and conflicts and 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 so many problems we are facing today and the greatest problem we face today is climate change and global warming and that climate change global warming is get, going to get worse and worse and worse and we will face uh, floods and we will face uh, wildfires and we will face uh, many many other problems and therefore um, rather than waiting for the collapse to come our responsibility should be to build the alternatives build new structures build new um, uh, projects so that when this big collapse comes we are ready with new ways of living which is more sustainable more regenerative more spiritual more holistic more creative more poetic more artistic these are the values eternal values spirituality and imagination and creativity and poetry and art these are the non polluting and, and 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 everlasting eternal values and the money building industry infrastructure airports railways um, motorways all these things that we have 
put so much energy and effort, they cannot go on forever. These are based on finite resources. And you cannot have infinite growth on a finite planet. This is a common sense. But unfortunately, common sense is no longer common. Can you imagine that this kind of infrastructure and, and, and economic growth, um, unlimited economic growth can go on on a finite planet? Not possible. So I think collapse is quite possible. I'm, I'm not predicting anything, but I think this cannot last. This is my feeling. And so my work, and I recommend you all to your work and our work is to create alternatives and, and a sustainable, regenerative and spiritually based and ecologically based and artistically based uh, structures we have to build so that when collapse comes, we are ready for it. Thank you, Satish. So time flies. Actually, um, we have far more questions on the list, but I think I'm afraid that we can only take this as the last questions. So um, this is another question from Josephine. She is asking, is caring for the soul as important as the soil? Could you share more about how we can care for the soul? Of course, of course. <clears throat> this is a very good question. The last question is the most uh, beautiful and important question. As I have written a book, and actually it is being translated now into Chinese and mainland China, and, and it's going to be published in Chinese, called Soil, Soul, Society. This is the new trinity for our time that I have presented, uh, because without inner transformation, outer change is not going to be possible, and it's not going to be lasting. We need inner transformation as much as outer transformation. We need social change, we need political change, we need economic change, but without our spiritual uh, dimension, our consciousness dimension, without the soul qualities, this external change will not last for very long. So we need to have inner transformation as essential as outer transformation. Those two go hand in hand together, like walking on two legs. If you walk only on one leg, you cannot go very far you fall down, you collapse. And so if you only focus on external change, economic change, political change, industrial change, infrastructure change, and without changing the soul quality, without being spiritual, without being contented, without being uh, in this uh, um, spirit uh, of service and, and humble and contented, if these soul qualities are not developed, then our future uh, is not bright. And, and therefore, it's a very good question. And please read my book, Soil, Soul, Society. I'm talking a lot about spiritual dimension and the soul dimension. Now, without soul, our body is a dead body. Without spirit, our body is a dead body. So as matter and energy cannot be separated, our body cannot be looked after without the soul. Well, if there's no love in your heart, there's no compassion for your family, there's no um, uh, generosity for your neighbors, and then you just have infrastructure and motors and, and cars and aeroplanes and, and railways and computers and televisions and lots of clothes and lots of money. What is the good of that? It's like a dead body. Uh, you, you cannot decorate dead body with our soul. And so, um, so soul is the life. Soul is the spirit. Soul is the consciousness. Soul is the difference between spirit and soul is simply the soul is more personalized. Each and every one of us have our own personal soul, uh, but the spirit is more universal. Like you are wearing a, a jumper made of wool and I'm wearing a jumper also made of wool. Wool is like spirit, universal. But the jumper which I'm wearing is particular to my body. In the same way, the jumper you are wearing is a particularly made to measure to your body. <clears throat> so soul is more personalized, more intimate, and the spirituality is more ultimate. But they are connected. Spirituality and soul are connected like two jumpers are connected by the, uh, by the uh, wool, woolness or the, the cotton or the silk, whatever they're made of. So in the same way, um, spirituality and soul are two aspects of one uh, total reality, the big reality. Uh, so we have to look after our clothes. So intimately, I have to look after my jumper. I have to look after my shirt. I have to look after what is I'm wearing. 
So as I look after my intimate clothing on my body, I look after my intimate inner body, and that's a soul. So I have to feed the soul with meditation, with love, with compassion, with kindness. Therefore, I always say that before you can love others, you have to learn to love yourself. You have to trust yourself. You have to believe in yourself. You are a spiritual being. You are, uh, you are uh, potentially a Buddha. A Buddha is not a special kind of person, but every person is potentially a Buddha, can be a spiritually enlightened being. But we don't pay any attention. We don't give any time to our soul. We look after our body morning and evening. We feed three times a day. We bathe, we decorate, we clothe. Uh, we do everything for our body. How much time are you spending for your soul? How much time are you spending to cultivate your spirit? How much time are you spending to enhance and, 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 and kind of um, enlarge your consciousness? Very little. We, we sp spend all our educational time just training the half brain, which is more, uh, more kind of logical and scientific and materialistic. We don't train our right hemisphere of the brain, which is a soul uh, connected with soul. And so each and every one of us need to find this inner transformation and outer transformation going hand in hand together, walking on two legs, spiritual leg and physical leg. Physics and metaphysics go together. Just physics, not enough. Just metaphysics, not possible. With our body, we cannot cultivate the soul. But with our soul, body is dead. And so take care of the soul. Soil, soul, and society. These are the three words, a new trinity for our time, to make a holistic vision. And they are interconnected. Um, uh, without soil, there is no soul. Because soil has soul. And without, um, without, soil, there's no, uh, without soul, there is no soil. And also, humanity is connected with the soil and soul. And so I put these three together as a holistic vision for the future of humanity and future of the earth. Thank you so much, Satish. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and insight and all the encouragement with us. And also thank you everyone for joining. I'm afraid we don't have time to go through all the questions, but I will try to consolidate them and see how we can feedback to the participant in some way. So thank you very much everyone for joining and contributing the questions, which makes the discussion so rich and meaningful. Thank you so much. Thank you for, thank you for as well. Um, thank you for uh, Kaduri Farm for organizing this wonderful Earth Day event and, and Kaduri um, um, uh, program, Earth program. Thank you and, and wish you a happy Earth Day. Yeah, thank you. So before we close the session here, I got a few important announcements that I would like to join uh, everyone's attention. So you will receive a questionnaire by email shortly, and we would like um, to have your feedback and please respond to it. And today's talk will be made available later on KFBG social media with subtitle. I encourage you to share it with friends and colleagues to extend the message to wider community. So the slide that you are seeing now, um, so the program that is related to today's talk, which include a book launch and a reading cup. Some of you is aware that um, the Chinese, traditional Chinese version of the uh, Satish book, the, man, the one that mentioned today, the elegant simplicity will be released in summer in Hong Kong. So there will also be a book launch attached to it. And another very exciting news is Satish will visit Hong Kong in October and he will teach a residential course under the KEP program. So please um, come back to our website and check details later. So another exciting news is about um, the upcoming talk, which we will have Wendala Shiva, David Abram, and also Om Sanessa to be our speaker. Um, all around the subject of we are nature, and we will explore this further in different perspectives. So you may scan the QR code on the slides for further details. So before we close the session, may I invite Satish back for a final word? Mm. Oh, I, I am delighted 
uh, to be part of uh, Kaduri Earth Program. I think it's a wonderful program, a series of uh, educational programs which you are organizing. And I would like all of you to spend some time with yourself, meditation, loving yourself, caring for yourself. You are very special. Each and every one of you are very special, a gift from the universe, a gift from, uh, from the world. And so look after yourself and, and, and have optimism and do your best and don't worry about the results. Thank you. Thank you so much, Satish. I got so much tear throughout the talk and I was deeply moved. I think um, there is a lot of resonance in all the participants tonight. Thank you so much. So the last but not the least, happy Earth Day to everyone, to Satish, and I wish you a nice evening or a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank Bye. -bye. You. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you.